I'm a firm believer in the mentality that knowledge is power, especially when it comes to tuning. So today we are going to do a deep dive on the mass airflow sensor. Stick around. What is going on everybody? Welcome back to the garage and today, well, we're going to talk about mass airflow sensors. We're not going to necessarily talk about the process of tuning. I've done plenty of videos on those. If you haven't seen one, go check out our YouTube homepage. You can quickly get there by going to www.tuning101.com and that link you can also share to other people that are looking for tuning knowledge. I also want to thank all the new subscribers and all the new patrons out there. Thank you everybody for your support. That all out of the way, I do want to talk about the mass airflow system, how it works. Uh, some of the things that you're going to learn by watching this video is going to open your eyes up to the process of what's going on whenever we use the MAF to actually dial in our fueling. It's a little bit of a misnomer whenever we talk about uh, tuning for fueling. We're actually tuning the airflow. The fueling, you need to think of it as a constant. If you go in and look at things like the stoic table, which gives us our commanded AFR, and then all the additional tables, those are just modifiers based on things like ECT, IAT, uh, startup, uh, power enrichment. But that is kind of our constant whenever it comes to going through the process of tuning. We're using the fueling as the tuning. And then with the wide band, we are seeing what our air to fuel ratio is. So if we know what the constant is on our fueling, take our air to fuel ratio, we then can calculate our air. Pretty straightforward. And I'm going to show you exactly how, but first let's talk about how the mass airflow sensor works. Back in the day, whenever mass airflow first came out, it was literally a paddle in the intake and as air pushed across it, it would move the paddle. That, moved, that registered on a rheostat and that went back to a calculation for mass airflow wasn't the most accurate because as the paddle would get pushed up in there, the uh, surface area would uh, change, so you would have to scale on surface area. A lot of calculations going on there, but it did matter because the density and, and uh, volume of the air, which equals the mass, if the density changed due to DA or you know temperatures, elevation, things like that, its effect versus that paddle would change. Eventually, the automotive world moved into the hot wire uh, style mass airflow sensor. That's where we're at today, even though we're on an evolution of a better version of it. And the theory behind that, I guess technically it's not theory, the way that operates is, is that you have a wire that is being held to a certain temperature. If you look at a card style math, there will be a uh, temperature sensor right beside that wire. And so what we're trying to do is heat that wire up to say 200 degrees. And once we reach 200 degrees, we read the frequency that it takes. We're pulsing electricity to it. We read how fast that we have to pulse to maintain that 200 degrees. As we have more air go over it, it sucks down the temperature from that wire and we have to increase the frequency to get that temperature back up to where we want it at. So we can look at our frequency table and see exactly what the frequency, and on some platforms it may use voltage, but it's the same theory. We can see exactly how much uh, energy it is taking to maintain that temperature on our mass airflow sensor. The cool thing about it is though, and we're going to see it here in a second whenever we look at one of our mass airflow uh, charts, is that then correlates to a uh, pounds per hour or whatever units you prefer uh, of the actual airflow across that sensor. We can then take that pounds per hour and calculate our pounds per hour on the fueling side. We're actually doing that backwards though. So we know what our pounds per hour for the fueling is. Whenever we look at our AFR readings on our wideband, we know that if we're commanding 14.7 to one, that pounds per hour is one for the fueling. If you were to multiply that by 14.7, that would give you the pounds per hour for your airflow to reach stoic. Same ordeal under power enrichment. You could do 10 and a half, 11, 11 and a half to one calculate your fueling and get your pounds per hour for your airflow. We're adjusting that offset because we know how much fuel that we're delivering. We don't always know how much air we're taking in. We adjust the air readings for the frequency until we get that stoic air ratio or that power enrichment air ratio. That all ties back and then at that point in time you have the perfect ratio. You know at this frequency, this many pounds per hour of air is flowing in, thus the engine is adding this many pounds per hour of fuel. Let's go ahead and dive into a tune and take a look at it. 
Okay, normally I'd say ignore the mess, but I don't really care. We're busy in the garage. It's going to be messy. Just bear with me here. So here we have a uh, stock mass airflow frequency curve brought up here. As you can see right here, we are reading this in pounds per hour. We can change it over pounds per minute, uh, kilograms per second. We could probably do cc's on here or grams. Uh, maybe not cc's. You can convert it over to cc's though. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but let's go back to pounds per hour because I like pounds per hour because it makes sense in the aspect of we're using this to uh, command our fueling. Before we dive into this section of it though, let's go ahead and look at our fuel table. So we've got our stoic. And so we're saying at zero alcohol, we're commanding 14.62. This is that constant that I'm talking about. This goes back to your commanded AFR or your commanded EQ ratio. And then all this other stuff is basically uh, variations or variables that can be applied to the fueling, but it is still a constant whenever we think about the air fuel uh, ratio. So if we go in and look at things like flow rate versus KPA, this isn't a good example because it's flatlined. This system must be on a uh, return. Uh, but you can look at all that things and the ECU is calculating all of these different things to calculate versus our stoic to get us that commanded AFR. And it goes down through all this other stuff, temperature control, uh, power enrichment, all of that, though, as I said, at the end of the day is what we consider like the constant in this. We go back over to our airflow table and look at our mass airflow versus frequency. This aligns up. If you were to come in here and look at, well, a great area is, is uh, right here at 21.25. We are flowing 15.1 uh, pounds per hour of air. So at that point, you know that you should be flowing around one pound per hour of fuel. If you were to go in and log that, that would line up. Uh, that's because the calculation, that's how it works out. Uh, the, the other cool thing that we can do is if you're running out of injectors, uh, you can come down in here and see what your airflow is that you're hitting. Use that to calculate the pounds per hour that you have on the injectors as you're starting to max out and then calculate uh, how much more that you may need on the injector side of things. So if we're looking at, say, we're running out of injectors uh, on an LS3, but we're wanting to run flex fuel on top of it, we need to add another 30% on top of everything else. Well, if we're hitting 1803.2, let's do the old calculator here. And we're going to calculate for stoic because it's going to have more air than uh, power enrichment. Then we'll calculate for power enrichment. But if we were at 1803 pounds per hour and we divided that by 14.7 at stoic, we're going to see that our injectors need to flow 122 pounds per hour for the injectors. Same ordeal if we were to do 1825 pounds per hour in air and divide that by 11 and a half for PE. Now we're up to 158 pounds per hour said you can tie all of this information back. Now don't get it mixed up because whenever we are reading pounds per hour on here, we are actually reading pounds per hour for the entire engine. This calculation is going to be by cylinder. So we would actually divide this by eight to get a realistic of we're flowing 20 pounds per hour per individual injector at that point in time. We're pretty low in the curve down here. Uh, if we were to go into a forced induction style setup, we could look at what we needed based on our boost levels, things like that. That's one thing to keep in mind whenever we're doing this, that a lot of the time these airflow tables are going to be looking at the total airflow volume of the engine, whereas whenever we look at injector flow rates, we're looking at individual injector flow rates. You need to multiply them by your cylinders to get the total flow rate. The other thing to be aware of though, whenever we're doing things like this, we look at the mass airflow sensor. If you were to add a uh, style of injection like uh, auxiliary injectors or methanol injection, what happens is, is whenever we get up here and we start seeing that additional fuel that's injected after the mass airflow sensor, we're gonna actually start to see a curve develop that, that goes down a little bit. So it'll be a little bit smoother than the one I'm putting in here, but where this is of detriment to us is now, even though it says we're flowing 801.4 pounds per hour of air, we're probably flowing closer to 989 uh, pounds of air per hour. Why is that an issue? Well, a lot of these tables are built on spark air mass, which is then tied back into uh, 
our, is calculated off of our airflow, be it through volumetric efficiency or through mass airflow. So what you might see beforehand is you might be working in a range of this area based off of our spark air mass, but since we have effectively changed our uh, curve and we're spoofing the system, we're saying that it's not making as much air as it is because we're adding fuel on top of the factory injectors, we need to be aware of where we're at on some of these spark air mass or cylinder air mass tables. So it's a good thing to always go back, log whenever you get your math curve uh, finalized out, take a look at where you're hitting on here because where you may have been up in this range beforehand, you might be down in this range and you might need to adjust because running 14 and, or 15 degrees of timing there might not be safe. You might need to be down to 11. So you can go in and kind of shift these tables down to match the area or the offset. It can still cause some issues if you are ramping in at a high rate on fuel. As long as you're progressive though, you should give yourself a little bit more leeway to get up into different areas where you can properly tune things like that. But just keep it in mind, whenever we are making adjustments to that airflow measurement like that, we are changing other tables. So you'll wanna go back through and double check any of that stuff. Well, hopefully this has given you a new way to think about how the mass airflow system works. It's not that complicated. It gets a little bit more complicated whenever we get into volumetric efficiency, but we're going to touch on that in another video down the road where we do kind of the same platform. We break down exactly what it's doing, how it interacts with other tables, and how we achieve our goals of hitting the perfect air to fuel ratios based on our setup. If you have any questions about this, hit up the comments down below. Let me know what they are. Uh, I know I kind of breeze through some of this, but it, you'll go as you, you know, get further into tuning, you will see things like this start connect. The strings will be drawn in between the two points and you'll say, oh, I see what's going on now. Having that intimate knowledge of how the system works is what makes you a great tuner instead of a good tuner. There's a lot of guys out there that can do a good tune on a car without understanding this information. There's probably too many guys out there calling themselves tuners that don't understand this information. This is the fundamentals. Just like any sport that you play, you might get lucky every once in a while, you know, making three pointers in basketball. But if you learn the fundamentals uh, early on and employ those as you play, you rely less on luck and you rely more on your skill, knowledge, and fundamentals of how to actually do something. So I highly encourage you to ask any questions about this. If you have any suggestions or comments on how the mass airflow system works, chime in. I'd love to hear those too. And as I said, we will be breaking down some other systems within the tune to help you guys get a better understanding of what's going on. I want to thank everybody as always. Make sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell, uh, leave comments behind. It's time to get back to work. You know the drill. Thanks for stopping by the garage. Always be tuning.